the software, the output of one software could be the input of other software and so on. Okay. So what is a version control? A version control system is a, is a system that will record changes in a file. In this case, we will try to record the changes in our scripts uh, over time, and that allows you to recover specific versions in the future. So we will do everything today, but uh, what the main point is that we can save all the, the chains and also recover uh, every version of our code uh, using this uh, version control system. And in this sense, a repository is just a like a folder, it's just a space where you can store uh, all your code, all your versions of your code, controlled by Git in this case, and our repository will be Bitbucket. Uh, in the practice, the use of these two systems is the safest way to keep your code secure. Uh, it will be keep everything safe online on the cloud, and also it could work as a lab notebook since you can track every change with a, a date and time uh, register. So you can know when you change everything and uh, why you change and what changed inside the, your script. We will address everything during your tutorial. So what is a workflow or a pipeline, as we usually say in bioinformatics? In, in software engineer, is just this concept is, consists only of a chain of process elements. In your case, it will be a change of softwares that uh, are organized in a way that the output of one element will be the input of the next one, and so on. So they work together. And they are, the name came from uh, analogy to the physical pipeline. So imagine, for example, this situation. This could be a representation of a, a pipeline. We have the raw data here, and then we have the first software that receives some parameters. These parameters will tell the software how to process the data, and then you will have some outputs. And these outputs could be used for the next softwares or for other softwares in some point in your workflow. And all of these uh, so input and outputs are related with each other. So this is what we could call as a workflow. Okay. So if we can create a script and execute all these steps uh, one by one to get in the same file, why bother to use uh, a workflow manager system? First, because when we have a, a big script with all your code there, uh, it's very time consuming and very inefficient to execute that. For example, if you need to change one parameter, you need to uh, open your script, change only that line in the code, and then or commit all the other the lines or remove this part of the code and run that by itself or run the whole uh, script again to reproduce your results. And even if you are a very organized person, it's very easy to forget details of your pipeline, details of the order of your softwares, how uh, the different softwares inside the script are connected with each other, and that will probably generate uh, the produce errors and unre unreliable results. For example, imagine this situation here. We have the same pipeline again. And for, one, uh, for any reason, you decide that you need to change the parameter B of the software one. Because the outputs of the software one are used as input for the other softwares, we also need to update to run again all these other softwares. If, since this is in the beginning of the software, it would be okay to run the whole script again, because you can, uh, you already changed this, you can execute everything and have all the, the outputs updated. But imagine a more simple uh, situation where we have here, for example, the output of the software tree is a plot. And based on this plot, you decide that the results are not good, you need to change some parameter here. So let's do that. When you change this parameter, you need to execute again the software tree and you are changing these two up, uh, outputs here. If you have a whole picture of your pipeline in your mind, you will remember that you need to change the software here that is in somewhere uh, inside your script. But if you have been working for, uh, you haven't worked in this pipeline for a long time, you will probably forget that and it's very easy to happen. So, you could uh, run the software, update these outputs, and forget to use this one. So ideally, what the uh, workflow manager system does for us is to recognize all these connections and to tell us every time we change one of the outputs that are also used as an input for another software, this workflow manager system will recognize that 
and run the updates for you. So if we have a, a, a something like snake make in this case, once we change this parameter here and execute this step here, all the steps that relies on these outputs files will be also updated automatically. So you don't need to be concerned all the time to how to connect your software or how changing one of the results will change the other ones. But in the snake make, instead of calling these softwares, we will call that as a rule. Because the same rule, you can execute different steps inside the rule. Even though, in general, we try to keep every rule to execute only one software and create these outputs. In theory, you could combine multiple different softwares in the same rule. So this is the basic idea of how a, a workflow works. Uh, so far, every, is everyone understanding that? If anyone have a question now, you can type in the, the Zoom chat and I'll try to address that. As I said in the beginning, I will try to address the questions in uh, different points of the presentation, but not in real time because otherwise I will uh, be too distracted with the presentation. But if you have any question now, it's a good moment for making it. If no one has a question, we will we'll see a few more slides about Snake Make and see. OK, yeah, we don't see any questions so far. So I will jump now for another uh, few slides here for about the Snake Make. And for that, I will take some slides that are already published for Johannes Koster, I think is how we pronounce his name. And he's one of the developers of Snake Make, and he's still working with the team. So uh, just for us to understand why we need to use a system as a, a Snake Make, uh, besides the reasons that are already shown. When we think about data analysis, we have a data set, a bunch of rules or parameters or softwares here that will execute using the data set, create other outputs that will work as input. And then in the end, you have your final results here. So initially you can think on doing that by hand. But when you start to actually realize your whole workflow look more like multiple data sets, multiple rules, in a very connected in a very difficult way to understand, to keep track, you decide that it's better to have a uh, help of a system uh, as a workflow manager. So the main reason, I, in my opinion, is that using a workflow manager, we can create reproducible uh, data analysis. And for that, there is three main concepts that we snake make will address first. The first of them is automatization, automation actually. What that means? That means that once we have the, the raw data, the data sets, and we have our code, it should be able to execute the cell itself without manual intervention and generate the results. So once we have our pipeline, our workflow structured in the snake make, we should be able to run one common line, and now the, the intermediary rules will be executed and reproduce the results for you without human intervention, without many manual intervention. Okay, the second point is what we call scalability. That is, once we have a pipeline, you could be able to use the same pipeline to execute for thousands of data sets and efficiently use any computer computing platform. So for example, here in Florida, we have in the University of Florida, we have the Hypergator system that has thousands of cores and uh, a lot of memory that we could in theory, execute multiple uh, analysis para in, in parallel. So we could use all this uh, resource at once. And if we have a good workflow that was set for that, it will be able to uh, take advantage of all this resource and run multiple analysis simul simultaneously. How do I say that? Uh, in, at the same time. OK. The third aspect that is very important is the portability. What that means is once we have a pipeline that is well uh, uh, structured, we can easily execute the same analysis in a different system or platform that contains the same environment. In this case today, we are not uh, doing the, the part, we are not creating the part that handle the whole environment, but the part that controls all the, the, the softwares, the version of the softwares, and et cetera what is already uh, a very good beginning to create a, a reproducible, reproducible pipeline. Uh, and why use Snake Make instead of using other tools? There are uh, multiple options of, 
uh, workflow managers, I really like with Snake Make because I think it's very simple to use and it's very popular. So uh, since it's popular, there is many people who there are many people who uh, create content and publish that online. So you can try to find solutions for your problem or uh, try to search for more advanced ways to execute uh, your workflow. So Snake Make is very popular in, uh, in the sense, and because it is based on Python. It makes the, the, the code very clean. It's very easy to read, to read it, to understand what is, uh, what is being executed. So I will stop here. I don't think we need to go further in these uh, slides. But if you guys want to check that, it's just in the manual of the Snake Make, there is a link for these slides here. There is way more advanced content by the end. But for today, since it is a hands-on hands -on, uh, workshop, I think I will stop here. And we can actually go for our tutorial. Uh, again, if you have any questions, just uh, let me know in the chat and I will try to address. I will make some stops between the sections of this tutorial. Uh, I feel like the, the tutorial is very complete, complete in the sense there is a lot of information. So I will try to skip some of the, the text, but show uh, how to execute the code, try to explain what I am doing in each one of these steps. If you are using the HTML file, you should probably be able to easily copy this file, these commands here and paste in the, in the terminal. I don't know how many of you guys will actually try to execute this code, but uh, what I will do, I will execute that on, on Hypergator. Uh, I am already connected here. So this, for the people who don't have a lot of knowledge about the Hypergator system, or how to work in servers. This is a Linux environment. So we will be executing uh, commands here by command line in a bash environment. So once we start to execute that, I will try to explain what we are doing. But if I forget anything, or if I use a term that you don't know, just let me know. Okay. Uh, just to begin, what we are doing is try to uh, recreate some steps of this paper here. That's a paper published on Nature with a pipeline to do a RNA sec analysis. We don't need to really understand what this paper is doing. Not even I will not even go in details about the samples or anything like that. Because the main goal here is how to transform command lines in a workflow. So if we look in the paper in the procedure section, they have all the commands there to execute the analysis and you could go to the paper in your own time later and understand everything if you feel like you need. For example, this first part here, what they are doing, they are using common lines to execute the software high set. And this software will take uh, reads from RNA-seq that are in these two files here. That is the read one, the fast queue file, read two and the fast queue file. And using these two input files, create this output file here. In the, same in, in the same format. We will see that. I am just like showing right now that what I'm doing is like taking these codes and creating a, a rule in Snake Make that will reproduce the same results. Okay. The first step in this pipeline is actually creating the directory that we, we need to, to execute the analysis there. Uh, in the paper, they have some scripts that rely on the, this name here. So you try to keep this name for now. Uh, even though in theory, our Snake Make pipeline will not rely on that. But if you want to execute all the steps of the paper by yourself in the future, you need this name. So the first step is using this command here, mkadir, actually creates a directory. So it's like make a directory. directory. Uh, so let's execute that here. Now, if we look in my Current directory, we have a new directory here with na the name I just created. So we are moving for this directory, directory now. So with this command here, pwd, I'm just showing where I am in the, in the Hypergator system. So I was here in the PSC workshop. And for the people who are not uh, used with these terms, directory, this is just like the folder that you see in your computer, in your Windows, if you use that. So inside this folder here, what I will do first is try to create a, a file called snake file. This snake file is, a, is the file that will receive all the rules that snake make understand. And 
uh, snake make when we execute the snake make commands, it will already uh, search for this file in the directory and try to to read them. So this name is a kind of a default for for this uh, this file that snake make will recognize. My idea here is while we create the the commands for snake make, we will at the same time keep track of all the chains in the Git and Bitch bucket. So Initially, let's do that. I don't know if the, the people who will try to execute the analysis tool, please uh, log in, make the login in your Bitbucket account. I think in the requirements, we ask people to create one account. If you didn't do that yet, you can do easily here. If you don't want to do, it's okay, just watch too. I will make the login, login in my account already. What is Bitbucket? If you, most of you guys probably already heard about uh, GitHub. They are basically the same concept. They are places where you can create your online repositories and keep your code there. Why I use uh, Bitbucket instead of GitHub? Just because in GitHub, you have a limit of how many repositories you can use for free. And in Bitbucket, you don't have this limit. You can create as many uh, private repositories as you want. So let me type my password here. Oops. Something's wrong here. Wendell, you can just stop sharing your screen for a second if you want. No, it's okay. I think now they will hide my password here. Yeah. Once we are in the big bucket, we have this system here. So here you can see some of my repositories that I already have, but the main point for today is create a new repository. So in the, the left side here, you have this button, create. We click on that, and then we will create a new repository. You can select here, it will create for us. Uh, in this case, you need to, to give a name for the project and for the repository that you want. I, will, I already have some project here that I was writing the code. And I will create a new repository here. And just one hint, uh, remember to, uh, to select this option here to make this repository private. If you don't select that, all your code will be accessible on the internet. So people can uh, Google, for example, and by chance find your code or find your repository. That is what we do when we want to publish the code. We just remove the private uh, option and make this repository public. And we are not, for now, we are not creating the readme file. We will do that later, just because I want to show some uh, options of Git for us. When we create the repository, the first thing we see here is some common lines that will allow us to connect the online repository with our current uh, folder in the Hypergator system. So, but for that, let me go back to the tutorial. Uh, before we, we connect, we can connect both, tutorial, both uh, repositories. We need to first initialize, uh, tell Git to start to control our folder, to start to use that as a repository for you. So the way we, did, we do that is with the command git init. So execute that here. Uh, I executed that here, and then now they are telling me, uh, git initialized a repository in this uh, address here. That is the folder where I am. Since I already have a repository here, I can now connect it with the repository that is created online on Bitbucket. I will go back here and copy this information here. The information we need is the one in the second line, the, the, the first line of this, the step number two. Okay, now both repositories are connected, but so far we don't have any file in our current repository, is that in, in our current, current folder to synchronize with the online one. So we will not execute the second step. Okay, now that we have both repositories connected with each other, we will create our first file that in this case is called snake file. The common touch here, it's just creating an empty file. And then 
once we have our file here in our current folder, we need to tell GitHub to start to control all the changes we make in this file. The way to do that is using the command git add. Okay. So I added the snake file to the version control by git. So from now on, every change I make in the snake file will be tracked by git. And as soon as we I start to make our synchronization with the online repository, we will see these changes there. Uh, just to show how it works, I will open this file and uh, add some header there. So we can we have some content inside the file that we can synchronize with the Bitbucket repository. Here, there is multiple options for you to, to open the file on the Hypergator system. I will use Nano for now, but uh, Pretty soon I will change for using the my editor, te my text editor of choice that is Arrow. I will show you guys that soon. So the nano snake file. And I can just pass the code here. And the reason that I am starting these uh, lines with a hash is because I want snake make to understand this is just a command. This, so snake make will not try to execute that uh, during your pipeline. So we'll save that. So now if I print the content that are in the snake file, we can see here the two headers. So now we have something uh, inside the snake file that we can tell Git to track. So I will execute this command here. Just uh, for you guys to know, I, make a, I made a small mistake here. We should not use the, the exclamation point in the way it is here, because this is like, it, it will be executed in, in bash and it will not understand this. So we will remove that and just make the, the command without that option. So what I'm doing now, the commit command is when we create a new version of our code. So every time we make a commit, we are saying, telling Git to save that version and track all the chains that were made uh, between the previous version and this one. We will see how this works pretty soon. And using the option M, it allows you to create a message here that explains what you are doing in your file. So you can track these chains when you, uh, when you look in the online repository. Sorry, I made a mistake here. You run that again. Okay. When I make uh, I execute the git commit, it will tell me what happened. So it's telling me like one file changed and there is two new insertions of code there. So now we have one file in our current folder that has a text there, that is a change. So let's synchronize that with the online version and see how we can see these chains in which bucket. The way to synchronize your chains with the repository is using the common called git push. The git push will move information from your local folder to your online repository. And to remove, to move information from the online repository to the local one, we'll use the common pool. So let's execute git push here. And since it's a private repository, it will ask my password. And now it is sending the information through, through, through the online repository. So let's go back here and check now. If we refresh here, now we can see that in our Online repository, we have a file called snake file. Uh, the time where this change was made, the last commit here, and what message I put here. In this case, I just put my first commit, but this message could be explained to you what you did. And if we select the file, we can see the content of the file here. And if we select here full commit, we can see all the changes that were made in the file. In this case, we just uh, inserted two lines here that are showing green. If we had remove any line, it will be shown in red here. So using this resource, we can uh, create 
synchronize our files with the bit bucket. So now my code is saved there. And if I continue to make chains and save commits as we will do during the, the course today, we can just go back here and find every version that was ever created for this software. Okay. Uh, just to show how to use git pull now, we use git push. So we send information from our local computer to the online repository. Now we do, we will do the opposite. I will create one file here in the online repository and then bring it back for my computer. So to add a file here, we can just select these three dots here then add a file. And I, we can add here the file name. I'll just put readme. And we can add a short description there. In this case, I will put this description here. Okay. So when I commit here now, what I'm doing, I'm creating a new file that have the content that I just pasted and storage that here in my online repository. So if I came here, now I have two files here. Let's bring this new file now for our local computer. Again, I need to put my password. This will ask our password every time we try to make any change. As, as I said before, the repository is a private one. Okay, so now we have both files here. So in this section, what we saw was how to use the, the core of the GitHub, the Git uh, commands. That is, Git in each to connect it, to make Git aware that you want to track files in that folder. Git add for every file that you want to track the chains. For every time you want to create a version of that file, you can use the Git commit and to send files from your computer to the lo from your local computer to the online repository. Uh, you use git push and to bring files from the online repository to your local, you use the git pool. So this is the main core of that. Uh, be uh, keeping your mind that in general, we do not create files here, but this same uh, online repository could be connected with multiple computers. I could have my, my computer connected here and the hypergator. So I could synchronize from my computer to there and therefore the hypergator and so on. So I think this is the main core of the, the Git. Uh, I think I will make a, a quick stop here so I can check if there is any question and address them. If you have a question now, you could uh, make now. We have yeah. a question now. Yeah, we have a question here is uh, about the origin master names. This nomenclature is a little uh, confusing. I was not playing go too much on that, but essentially, yes, we, we, have, we can have multiple oranges working with the same master. And then uh, the way to synchronize that is a little more complicated. For example, if you have like one uh, online repository with multiple uh, local repositories, we could also have multiple people working the same project. So to synchronize all these change at the same time can be a little more tricky, but essentially is, the, is, the, is that what you do? You have multiple chains in the same place and these oranges will talk with the master and try to synchronize these files. Yeah, one question here, right? If we can have only the, the scripts in the folder to synchronize or if we could also have big files. You can have as many files as you want inside the directory, as long as you don't uh, you don't add them to Git. So, for example, if I have more files than these ones, Git will continue to track only these two because it's the the two fi only files that I uh, I told it to track using the Git add command. It is not a good idea to have very big files in the Git because it will not be able to synchronize with the online repositories. And in general, the online repositories have a restriction of how much content you can save there. So I would also always uh, try to keep only my code in the Git. And if I have, for example, input files or data sets and stuff, keep in other repositories. But you, could, you can keep everything in the same 
uh, in the same folder as long as you don't you do not tell git to track the chains on there okay everyone else has any question about that yeah and i recommend everyone to check the git the git web page that is much more options there and they have a lot of materials explain how you can use different repositories to work together how you can for example have one uh file to work together yeah and i was going to address now they also tell you how to create a git ignore file because the the important thing of the git ignore file is because then you can use git commit easily for all your comments if you have like a git ignore file it will tell Git to not track the files that are listed there. So if, for example, I can use come here and say git commit, I don't know, uh, update, and then use this symbol here that means all. It will try to, to update all the files. I could also do the same with git add. If I have multiple files and I don't want to add one by one, I could use git add all. But in this case, if I have other files here, it will be a problem because Git will try to control all of them. So to keep this safe, I need to have a Git ignore file there. And in this Git ignore file, put all the files that I don't want Git to, to track at all. So I mean, this is, uh, is a little more advanced uh, content than I was expecting to, to explore today. So that's why I didn't put in the pipeline. But I think this is a great thing that you guys are already aware about these limitations. And as I said, I recommend you all to, to check the Git menu. There is much more options there and much more content than I am showing here. The idea here was just to show the main uh, core of the comments. And why will we see the pipeline? It will be even more clear when we finish why this is so important to keep track of all the versions of our code. Okay, can I go ahead and continue to now actually start to build our pipeline. Okay. So the first step here, before we start to, to build the pipeline, we will make the download of the data sets. Uh, if we check this link here, we can see all the data sets that are available for that paper. The only one we need is this one here. And if I click here, I will download this for my computer. But since I am in the hypergator, there, way to do that is using the common called wget. This will download the files uh, for us. But before that, I will create a developmental session here in Hypergator. So I avoid to execute any command in the login computers of the Hypergator. They don't like when you do that. So I will create a very small section here. For the ones who do not know what I'm doing here in the Hypergator, I am basically asking uh, Hypergator to provide for me one computer with one core, two gigabytes of RAM memory, and I intend to use that for two hours. So I'm just like create an environment where I can execute my code without create troubles for that. Okay, so let's download the, the data sets for us. This data set, they will be uh, compressed. So it essentially, it's like the zip files we commonly see in Windows machines and everything else. But uh, in this case, we have multiple files compacted in one folder that was compressed. So I will use this command here that is from tar to uh, expand these files and we will give a quick look in all the, the files we have in this folder. Just a second for you to finish the download. How many of, of you are actually trying to execute the, the code? If anyone is executing the code, please say yes now in the chat. So I have one idea of how fast I can go here. Okay. Yeah, we have one. Okay, great. Yeah, I I'm just want to know because then I can uh, go slower. Yeah, I just ask how many of you guys are executing the code in your computer or in the Hypergator? Uh, that was the question I made. Okay. We now have the full list here again. We can see that we have the data sets we just downloaded. Let's 
and compress these files now. Thank you. So while the, the software is expanding the files, we already have a, a good idea here of what they have there. So the folder is called chromosome X data. This is because this pipeline uh, is made using only the chromosome X of the human genome to make it shorter. Uh, this information is in the paper there. This is not super important for us, but it's good to know. Uh, another information that we need to hear is that in the folder genes, they have a GTF file with the annotation of the genome. And in the folder indexes here, they have all the index of the, the chromosome X of the human genome. So we are going to use all these files to reproduce the rules that we have. And uh, also we have the, the samples. In the folder samples here, this is the name of the samples. Each one has a number as a code and chromosome X, because as I said, these RNA-seq reads were selected to be only from the chromosome X. Okay, so let's see here. We can remove this file now. We don't need that anymore. And let's list here folders. So again, these, those are the samples that we have in this experiment. Just remember that since we have uh, RNA sec reads, we have parent reads in this reads in this case here. So we have the reads number one and the reads number two for each one of the samples. And we have, uh, I believe, 12 samples on total. Okay. So let's create our first rule in the snake make file. Uh, in the beginning, I will try to, to keep that very simple. Uh, I am just basically just copying all the comments here from the, the tutorial in the paper to a rule in the, in the snake make file. And we can now copy this whole code here and put that in the snake file. And then I will explain what this code is doing. Instead of opening the files now in Happy Gator, I will connect that using uh, the text editor that I usually use. It's called Atom, like this. This is the name of the text editor that I use. The reason why I'm connecting with that is because I have a package that allow me to write the code in my computer and synchronize this code with the Happy Gator system. So I don't need to use Nano or VI. For this presentation, it will be faster in this way. Let me just open this here. And if you guys have curiosity about Hypergator or oh, about Arrow or how to use this package, I can send the names of the packets for you guys in the, the, after we finish the workshop. So, okay. So let's copy this command here and add that in our snake file. So I just copied and pasted the command here. And when we save that, when I save here in the case, I am already synchronized, synchronizing it with the Hypergator system. Uh, let's try to understand what it, it is the rule, the snake make rule. Basic, the snake make rule has a few parts. First, we need a name for the rule so you can call it during the, the execution of the scripts. You have a section with the input where you can put the names of the input files that will be used in your code. We have a section called output. This lists all the outputs that will be generated. In this case, I already know all these names because I'm pulling the pipeline from the, the uh, paper. In general, that is what we do. You create, you execute the, the, the analysis, you understand what inputs and all, what outputs do you need, and then you create the rules on snake make to make sure that it will be reproducible in the long run. And here in the shell section, I have the code. It's exactly the same code of the paper. So what this code is doing, calling the program right set, this parameter here is to select six cores to run that in parallel in the Hypergator. This parameter here, I create a limit of the number of reads that we are going to use just to make the analysis faster. So we are only used 200,000. Uh, this is the GTF. No, actually the index of the genome where we want to map the reads. And those are the files, the input files, the 
uh, read number one, read number two, and this is the output file that will be generated. That is the same file containing the alignment. For the ones who are familiar with RNA-seq, I think this is not very uh, difficult. So to understand what we are doing. Okay, with this rule here, actually I don't have much many advantages of using the shell script yet, but this is the basic structure. For now, we will start to change this code to make it more flexible in the way we can uh, not need to put the names of every file in the rule by itself. We can create some functions to read them. Okay, uh, let me go back here to the tutorial. I will address the questions just in a second. Let me check, uh, go a little further here in the pipeline and then we will stop to address them. For example, okay, now we have a rule saved in the snake file. Let's try to execute this file just so we can see how snake make process there. Uh, in the hypergator, we have a module called snake, file, snake make that will load the snake make. So now we can access the file. Uh, what I will do here is what we call a dry run. It's when you try to execute the rule, but you don't actually execute that. This will just show for you all the parameters in the way that snake make intend to execute this rule. So let's execute here snake make. The way to do that is adding the, the option N and the option P here means print the commands for me. So when we execute that, this is what we see. So again, what snake make is doing here? We have the rule mapping. Snake make recognize all these files as input files, all these ones here as outputs, and these are the code that are going to be executed. Okay, again, this is not very different of what we usually do in a shell environment. Okay, uh, let's jump now for the rule number two. The number rule number two will do the same task, but I start to change a little bit the code so we can make that more flexible. And after the rule number two, I will address the questions that you may have. Okay, again, what I did here, we have the inputs. I didn't change anything in this section, but Sorry, but I create here one section called params. What I'm doing here is defining variables that will contain, will store these values. For example, I have now a variable called threads that contain the number six. And this variable here has the genome index. We have all the output files here. The difference here is that now, for example, if I decide to change from six to eight threads, I don't need to change that in every command line here because I already have this parameter here. Can you see like the selection here? So basically what I am doing is create variables that I can use in my command and in a way that it's more flexible. If I want to change anything, I can just come here, change the parameter and it will be uh, changed in all the rules automatically. And in the future, in the next step, we will see how to make that even more flexible because right now we still need to come here in the file and change the number in the rule by itself. Also, the second point here is that we are, we are also calling now the input files by an index, by, name, by number instead of the name. So if I have the in files here, input files here, uh, just one uh, observation here is that in Python, we start to count by zero. So the input zero is actually the, the file number one. If we look here, we have the sample number one here and the number two. They are the input zero and the input, input one. Together, they will produce the output number zero. So, so far, it's not super flexible yet, but we already have some parameters here that we can change. And also the files, if we change the order of the input files here, as long as we keep the pair of the samples here, it, do not matter too much. The software will still be able to execute that. Okay, let's save this code here. And uh, just to finish this part, before I address the questions, let's try to execute the dry run here. So we can see that even when I change that parameters uh, for the variables, snake make is still recognizing all of them and creating the script, the code for us in the same uh, way as it did before. 
Okay. Uh, I will stop now and check the questions. If you have some any question now, you, it's a good time to to make it now. Okay. Uh, the first question here is from Juan, and he said, "What if, if you don't have the names of the the files yet? You just have the you just know the end with the FastQ uh, extension. I will show that right now in the next step." how you address uh when how you could address that when you don't have na names for the rules um yeah how the variable inputs talk with the variable output this is essentially like the, the snake make will connect this and uh the way they talk actually is by your command line so we have your our shell command here that is taking two of the inputs and create one output. And right now, we still have in the whole name here, but in the next step, we will see how uh, having the, the input here and the output, we can actually have variables also representing these names instead of having the whole name there. Yeah, the, the common snake make will always try to look inside the snake file, as this question here is saying unless you provide an option in the snake make telling it to search for a different file. It will always try to find the snake file in the same uh, directory where you are. Uh, if you don't want that, there is an option. You can search, uh, executing the snake make. Help. There is a lot of options here. I'm not sure if I will find that easily, but there is an option here where you can show the name of the file where you have the code instead of uh, HPC, oh, instead of uh, uh, snake file, you can do that. Yeah, uh, there is another question here that I have a shell section in both rules. Can we format that as a rule? Yeah, as a loop, yes. I will do that in the mapping option number three. We'll just see that in the next step. How to synchronize the snake file in arrow? with the HPC. I will need to send for you guys this information by email because I don't remember the name of the package anymore, but there is a add uh, works like R. You can install multiple different packages to do different functions. So in this case, I have a package here. I don't remember the name right now, but I will send for you guys for sure after we talk, we finish here, that do this connection for me. So every time I save my file here, it is our, the package will connected directly with the hypergator. So in the package they have, I needed to put all my information, including my password to connect there. Yeah, you guys are going to make uh, a lot of questions that we will address soon. For example, uh, do we need to call modules inside snake, make, snake file? Uh, yes, if we are going to execute this code in the Slurm system as jobs, or we could also call the modules here uh, in our developmental environment and then run snake make. If we don't have the modules here and we need them, the, the snake make will fail because it will not be able to access uh, the programs, the softwares. But as I show by the end of this tutorial here, show here, well, here. There is a way where you can put a tag inside your snake file to load the, the modules that you need. We are not going that, to do that right now, but if hopefully we can uh, go through all this process. If not, you can just check the pipeline in, in the tutorial in your house and you will be able to understand that. Okay, I think that was it about the questions. I hope I answer all of them well. Some of them we will just see uh, the solutions for them right now. So let's uh, go back to the pipeline here. Okay, since now I have two new rules in my snake file, I will tell Git to save a version of them. Okay, when I commit now, Git is telling me you changed one file and you have 112 new insertions on this file. Uh, just by now, I will not synchronize this with 
uh, big bucket yet. I will do that in the next step. Okay. Uh, most of the questions here was how to make this rule more flexible because we don't want to be putting the names of the rules of the input files and output files all the time in the file in the rule. So what we can, the easiest way to do that, in my opinion, is creating what we call a configuration file. So essentially, this file is a new file that we will have in the same folder, and every parameter, every configuration that is flexible, we are going to add inside this configuration file. And then when we execute snake make, it will check the snake file, then check the configuration file, read the parameters there, bring it for the rules, and then run the rules. So uh, this sounds a little complicated, but it's actually easier than we think. Let me create this new file here called config eml. EML is the, the name of the language that we are using in this file. I put the link here. I don't think you guys need to check that. It's a very simple language. And with the code I will show here, uh, you will probably be able to understand how it works. Okay, so now I have a new file here called config.eml, and I will also add this for Git. So Git can control all the changes. In there. The easiest way to connect the two files to make Snake make aware of the configuration file is adding this uh, tag here with the name of the configuration file in inside the Snake file. So what I will do here, go back to our Snake file. The best place to put this code is in the beginning of your tutorial. So I will put that right after the comments that we have here. Save that. Okay, so now we have inside the snake file, one information that is the rules need to use the configuration file to read the, the parameters. And I will also open this file here. Have both files now. Now, uh, I think we. I am going to address one of the main questions that was how to avoid to insert the name of the files in the the input files or in input part of, section of the rule or in the output. For that, there is many. There are many ways to do that. Uh, there is something called wild cards that I personally I don't like as much of using that. I think is a little tricky to understand. I prefer to use the function called expand. And this is what I will do uh, in this next rule here. So now I create a new rule called rule mapping. And we can already see that the code is way more uh, short than the previous code. So I will put that here in our snake file. So we can compare these rules and see what I changed. What I made here, the main change, I think initially is the use of the function expand to create the input files for us. I will address that just in a second. The other change is that now, uh, instead of putting, adding the information of the parameters here, I am actually telling Snake Make to go to the configuration file, to check in the, this section, then in this section and take the value with this name. I will show how it works right now. Let's uh, add some information in the configuration file. You have the code here right be uh, below this section. So let's save some information in the configuration file here and I will try to make it easier for us to understand. Okay, so now we have both sides, both uh, files side by side here. This is the snake file, this is the configuration file. So when I pass a parameter like this, genome index, what I am telling for snake make, config is a variable that receives all the information in the configuration file. Then I am saying, in the config, go to the section mapping. We can see this here. Then we have a parameter nested inside that. Go to params, it's here, and then take the information of genome index. So when I execute this rule, uh, Snake make will create a parameter called genome index with this information here. And this information is actually in a different file. 
So now it's way easier for us to modify our files. If we, for example, if we change the address of the index for another folder, I don't need to change anything in my snake file anymore. I came here and changed the address here. So this is how you uh, make your, your script a little more flexible. Okay, so for the parameters, it is easier to understand. You just follow the, the indication of the config file. For example, the input suffix here, I go to the configure file mapping, it's here. Input suffix, it's here. So I am creating a parameter here with a vector with these two options here. Okay, let's try to understand how the expand function works. Essentially what we are doing here is creating three variables like called D, dir, samples, and impute suffix. What expand function will do is try to, uh, to combine these variables, all the content inside these variables, you create all the possible names that follow this structure here. So all the names that the expand can create uh, will have as the directory, the directory, uh, this, the information inside this variable here. And if we look that, it is here. So all the names will start with chromosome X data samples. Then we have like the slash here, samples. Samples here is also a variable that is in the configuration file, inputs. So, okay, everything will start with this and one of this information here. And then last, we will add this suffix that could be the reads one or the read two. So all the combination between this parameter, this one, and this one that follow this structure here, we generate names that uh, Snake Make will understand. Let's visualize that this in an easier way. Okay. The best way to visualize that again is running a dry run. So again, once mo uh, more, the parameters in means do not run the code, and P means print the code for me. So now we see here, even though using that expand function, SnakeMaker is being able to reconstruct all the names of our input files. So again, the variable there, all the sample names, and the suffix for each name. That could be the read number one or number two. All that combination of variables produce the same set of inputs that we already have. Okay, so we know how uh, the expand function works and we are doing the same here to the outputs, but the outputs I just need one variable, just the simple names here. So using the simple names, it will read the configuration file, this section, this subsection here, all these names. So the output will create one file uh, and also I'm directing all the outputs for a folder called mapping out and uh, with the samples here. Let's go back to the code here. We can see that SnakeMake is creating the outputs for each one of our samples. It is creating one same file and saving that in the mapping output, mapping out. However, we did not create this folder yet. If we lack in our files, we don't have, if we look in our folder, we don't have that folder here yet. Snake make will do that automatically for us. So we don't need to be concerned about that. As long as we have this information here in the output function, Snake make will be able to understand that to create a new folder for us. And last, the, let me see, put that here. The last change I made here was create a loop for, to work, a for loop, to work in our, uh, samples that we have listed here in the inputs. So how I did that? I create a parameter here called samples that we can observe here that has the information of all the samples name. So the loop for will go to for each sample execute this command line here. I don't know if everyone is familiar with how a for loop works, but essentially we are telling for each 
name inside this parameter here to create a new command line that receives the information that are here in these parameters and the sample that is stored here. So let me show that in a better way. Here. If we look here in this part of the code, that is the shell section, we can see that the for loop will look in every file of these ones here that are just the names of our samples. And we'll create a code that has six as a threshold. That is just this parameter here, the number of threads we create there. The maximum number of reads that is actually this parameter here. So, and the so on. So like the, the index and for the inputs files, it will change the variable file to the actual name of the files. So essentially the for loop will create, will run the code for each one of the samples, creating the, the output for us. So what is the main point of making the rule as this one? We are quite flexible already here. This input function do not, uh, doesn't matter how many samples you have here, as long as you have the names of the samples here, it will recognize and execute that. Same way, doesn't matter how many out outputs we have, as long as we have the names here, it will be able to reconstruct the names here. And since I'm using a for loop here, doesn't matter how many samples I have neither, because for each sample I have, the for loop will execute the command once, creating one output file. So essentially what I'm saying that this rule is very close to what we will do in real life. Because with this rule here now, you can have how, as many samples as you want here. And this rule will process that, generating the mapping file for each one. Let's go back for our tutorial here. OK, I think this was probably the hardest part to follow because it's a lot of information at the same time. So I will make a stop again. If anyone has any questions that uh, you want to type in the chat, I can try to address them. Uh, just remembering that there, is, there are, show, there are uh, options that I'm not showing here. I opted to use the expand file with the configuration file because I think this is the easiest way to understand that. But you could also use what they call wild cards that is a little more complex, but essentially do the same thing. We have, you have some inputs files and outputs here and it will create that for you. Okay, I think we have the, the first question here. Okay. Uh, in this case here, it will run one by one because it is the way uh, the for loop is set here. If we, are, we were using a different organization of the code, we could try to create, uh, for example, sub jobs here, as we do in the Hypergator system, and have this code running more than one by one. This is the way I create the code here. You could try to, using the manual, change that to execute every step in parallel. Uh, in this case here, yes, it will run one by one. But you could, you could also have more than one rule running at the same time. For example, let's assume you have uh, the mapping job and you also have a, a different job that do not interfere with this one. Both of them could be run at the same time. So uh, I think that the easiest way to run, to run multiple tasks at the same time inside one rule is using the wild cards. But I would prefer to not try to explain that here because it's a, it's a little tricky uh, concept. And also, since we have two file, two input files for every output, it's make e even harder to actually use the wild card. It's easier when you have one input file for every output. But again, checking the manual, there, there are options to create this uh, input and output here, and also to change the code in a way that this rule will run multiple tasks simultaneously at the same time. Okay. Yeah, they're saying here. So far as they make is trying to organize the variable and in the script. 
does it also improve the efficiency in the computation? Uh, actually, I don't think it improves a lot in the sense that you, you, in this case here, we only have one rule, but it will improve when you have a better workflow. Let's assume, for example, that we have multiple rules organized in our file. And these multiple rules, they can run independently of each other. When we run the whole workflow, Snake Make will be able to execute all of them simu simultaneously at the same time. This word is a little hard for me, sorry. Uh, and get uh, running all these rules at the same time. I also manage to keep the inputs and outputs relationship and executing uh, only the rules that you really need in that particular time. So if you do that, you will save a little bit of time because you don't need to execute rule by rule as we are doing here so far. At the end of this tutorial that I created for you guys, uh, you will see how to execute all the rules of your workflow at the same time. So I don't think we will be able to go that far today, but in the tutorial, you will be able to see how to do that. Does the rules have orders? Uh, in theory, no. Uh, what Snake Make will do is create first the relationship between input files and output files. In general, just because uh, it's a thought process, you will kind of write your script with the first code first, but you could change the position of the rules in the file. It will not matter if you establish well the connections between the input files of one rule, the output files of one rule, and if these outputs are used as input files of the other ones. So Snake Make will first read all your rules, establish all these connections, and then execute the rules in the order that will uh, uh, follow this dependence between inputs and output files. The only exception for this rule is when we execute Snake Make like without the, the name of the rule. For example, if I only execute snake make NP, it will try to first execute the first rule in the pipeline. In our case, it will not matter because we only have, actually it is, if you, it will, because we have, let me go back here, just a sec. Okay. We have three rules here, right? If I don't put the name, the snake make will try to execute the rule that is on top of our file. In this case, is the mapping option one. So, uh, besides when you don't have any rule in the name of Snake Make, yes, it, it doesn't matter the order of your scripts. Uh, Snake Make will be able to deal with all the connections between outputs and, uh, and inputs and outputs. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if I understood correctly this, this question here, but uh, in this context here, we are actually, we will remove these both these two rules here because they are doing the same job. So we don't want uh, in, in, the, in your workflow, two rules that produce the same output files. So I will remove these two ones here and keep only mapping because they, three of these rules produce the same results. So it doesn't matter which one I keep, but I will like I like more this one because it's more organized. But ah, okay, yeah. So this is is the thing I was just putting the the option one and option two was just to explain the whole process of starting with a rule that is exactly the same shell code, and then you start to change that for parameters, showing how you could address these and then how to create a more flexible rule using the configuration file. So let's go ahead and uh, go back to the tutorial. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will now remove these two rules here. Keep only the mapping rule, because as I said, we don't want uh, the, sa the same outputs to be created for more than one rule. Because if you have a rule that uses that as an input file, Snake Make will not be able to tell, okay, this is coming from mapping option one or from mapping option two because it's the same file. 
So we do not we do not want this kind of uh, redundancy in our code. Okay, I save that. I will commit here now both snake file and configure file. And now I want to also synchronize these chains with the big bucket. So I am running again, push orange master. Okay. Let's check how these chains will appear here in the, the online repository. So, so far we have three files that are being controlled by um, Git. And if we look here in the snake file, that is the one who had more chains. We already had multiple commits here for the same file. So if we look the, in this one, we can go back for the first version of our code that only had the comment, the header. If I want the second version, I can select the second commit. And then I have here mapping one, mapping two. But if I just want the newest version, I can select the newest common uh, commit and I have only the last rule with the. So I don't know if you guys are realizing that, but what it means that is that I can go back for any version of my code and download this version. So let's assume for example, I have a code who works today. Then tomorrow I have one idea and I change this code and it breaks the process. And I cannot go back and restore what I had done because I forgot already what I changed. So I just came here and select a second, uh, a previous version, the version that used to work, and I download that again. So let's see the full commit of this last rule here. So as we can see, all the chains are tracked here. We, in red, we have all the lines that were deleted, and in green, we have all the lines that were inserted in the newest version, in the version of this commit here. So basically we have all the chains in our code selected for us. So not only we can go back and uh, download the files that used to work, the previous version of our files, uh, as we can also see change by change what happened there. Okay. Yeah, I see we have more questions here. Let me address that before we go to the other steps. Okay, uh, this question, again, uh, if snake makes only recognize a file called snake file or if can recognize different files. Yes, uh, initially, if you don't inform snake make about the, the name of the file, it will search for snake file. But there is an option, I forgot the name of the option, but we can try to check here. Where you can tell snake make the name of the file that you want to, that has your rules storage there. Try to find it here. Yeah, as you guys can see, the snake make has a lot of options. So it's a little difficult to keep track of all of them. Ah, here. You can use this flag here and put a, a different file with a different name. But if you just create a file called snake file, it will recognize it uh, at once. And also I like that because Using Atom, it already recognized the snake file as a Python code and put all these color schemes here. So it's easier for me to just read the code. That is also something nice about Atom. I already saw one question about that. What I, will, I think I will do is create a list of all the packages that I use in Arrow and send for, for Christina and Christina can share with everyone. Uh, because for example, Atom is a very good uh, ed text editor for coding. Because first you have all these color schemes that are really nice. You can also add this uh, window here that really helps when you have a very long code. So you can scroll quickly and actually see the colors and more or less the shape of your code here. So there's many options that we can use. And one of the reasons that I keep the name as a stick file is because I don't need to pass uh, this information when I execute the command snake make, 
and since it will already recognize it, and also it's easier for me to just edit in the in my text editor. Okay, I think we already had a lot of information. So, uh, how what do you guys think? Do you want to you want me to continue like that? Go a little further. I think the next step uh, in the code maybe is a little more complex, but is very nice for people who use Hypergator because it's how to to uh, use Snake Make to submit jobs in the Slurm system for you. So if you guys want, I can go to all this step two, but if everyone is already tired or uh, exhausted already of so much information, we can stop here and open for questions in the video or chat a little more. So whatever you guys prefer. I would like to know more about um, running it on Hypergator. Okay, that sounds good for me. I also see here in the, yeah, and so far is everyone understanding what I, I what I'm showing, all these concepts and also the, the importance of using uh, a version control software. I think this is very important for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, once in my, in the beginning of my PhD, I deleted my folder accidentally in, in, the, in the server with all my code. I mean, everything. I lost lost everything, but in fact, I had most of my codes in GitHub, so I was able to survive. But this is something that can happen. We can really uh, screw our lives by deleting our files uh, by accident in, in the server. There is no way to recover that. So I think it's a very good idea to always keep your code under version control on Git and GitHub or Git and Bitbucket, depending what you prefer. Uh, just one more information about this. Uh, if you guys are students, you can use GitHub uh, with more private repositories. Like if you are not a student, you only can use three private repositories. If you are a student, there is a way you can send your email for them and they will verify that. And then you can use as many as you want. So this is a is a, a very nice thing to use GitHub in this purpose. But for honestly, for me, uh, Bitbucket work really well. I don't see any reason for using GitHub besides the fact that it's more famous and everybody knows what Bit, what GitHub is. Okay. Uh, let me see the questions here. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Like, uh, there is one person asking to, for me to also share some information about how to, to be more familiar with the snake make syntax. I would say the manual is probably the, the, the best resource we have. It's very complete, complete, but it's also kind of hard to, to read. But I think with our tutorial and the manual, you can uh, recover a lot of information. But I will, I will also list uh, some resource that I have seen. I have seen some online tutorials, some YouTube videos about uh, snake make and also about Git and GitHub. So I can uh, prepare some files today or, or tomorrow and send from, from PSC, from the Plain Science Console, and then they spread for you guys. Okay, okay, let's continue here. I can just. Ah, first of all, let's is actually execute the, so, the command line because so far we are just running what I call like the dry runs is the term they use in the software that the, you run just the commands to see how it will be processed, but you don't really run the command. So let's uh, actually run that now and create, generate the files for us. Once again, this is the dry run. We see all the inputs, outputs, the command that will be executed, and I will remove the option in now to execute remove. Oh, that's not, ah, I know what is that. That's the, one of the questions you guys made here about loading the modules. So I am trying to run snake make before I, I actually load the software here. But first, I will exit exit is the development section that I had because I was I didn't have enough resource there. 
So I will create a new one here where I'm requesting six cores and 10 gigabytes of memory. Okay, now we will load again Snake Make and I will also load the HiSet tool. That is the software who will make the mapping for us. Now we should be able to run. Yeah. So now it's like make is running the code for us. One nice thing to see is like here. It will be fast anyway, but uh, one nice thing they say they do for you if you are running like the whole pipeline or multiple rules, it will show you how many jobs it will need to run and the name of the jobs here that in the case is the name of the rules that you have. In our case, we only have one, but it will run. So here uh, we can see the results for each sample. They will map the reads and show you here the percentage of reads, mapped reads and etc. We don't need to go deep on that. I just want to show you guys one problem of using uh, is they make in, devel in the development section instead of running jobs uh, in the S-Batch, that is sometimes you can have incompatibilities between the modules. So for example, when I run snake make, snake make relies on Python 3. And uh, the high site is also loading Python 2. So I have both modules load at the same time in my development system. And that's why I have these error, error messages here is because these two versions are creating problems with each other. Even though the, the software is able to, to run, we still having these problems here. So uh, I think I put a note about that here, yeah. Uh, for us, everyone should always be conscious about that, that sometimes you have dependencies in your files that will break your code. So you need to be more careful when you execute that. The way I usually do that, we will see in the next step, I don't run anything in the developmental section, session. I run that by submitting jobs for the Hyper Gateway. And that means that I don't need to load snake make uh, in the jobs, only here in the developmental section. And then in the jobs, I only load the, the modules that I actually will use. I will show that soon. Uh, while this finishes here, I will go a little bit ahead in our pipeline in our tutorial, sorry. So what we are going to do now, we are trying to, we are going to try to run jobs as if we are submitting uh, jobs in the S batch system. So Snake Make will run jobs for us in the Hypergator using Slurp. Uh, for the ones who are not used to run this kind of jobs in Hypergator, what we do generally, we create a file called S batch file or SBAT script. And in this file, we have a lot of information that we need to provide for the Slurm system. For example, we need to provide uh, the name of your job, like the, the, your email so they can tell you if the job is running or not, the number of cores, number of tasks, uh, the amount of memory, the time that we are using, your QoS that is like uh, the account from where they will take the resource from. So, we, and also in the, as batch files, we learn, we load the modules here too. Uh, so essentially what we are going to try to do now is creating a different file that is make, make we read and execute the jobs passing the same information for Slur without using a actual S batch script. The way to do that is uh, adding the option cluster to the, the command line. When we add the cluster, what it does, it will open you an uh, option where you can provide all this information, number of cores, amount of memory, everything that you need uh, for Slurm to recognize so it can run the code. One, uh, one observation before that, as you guys already noticed, when we want to, to execute this code, we need to tell Snake Make to load the modules that we need. The way I do that is kind of a, a tricky actually, uh, I create a, a Python, a little bit of Python code here that I will insert in my snake file. And what this uh, command do is it will check, 
this is running, if uh, running is learned environmental is equal to true, run this. So that means when snake make start to read my snake file, if they found that this variable is set as true, it will load all these modules here in the Hypergator system. And the names of the modules, you can separate them by semicolon here. So, and shell prefix is the name of the function to execute that. Uh, now that our code is done, let me add this to our snake file. Again, the best way, the best place to put this information is right before your first rule. So what we can do is add this information here. First step, why I create this variable here instead of just executing this common line here? Because if I want to run this code in my development mode or on my personal computer, I don't have these modules there. I don't want to load these. So I can just come here, say false. And from now on, snake make will not try to load these modules anymore. But in this case, let's keep that as true. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the best way to load the modules on snake make. You could also load the modules inside each shell command. But in my experience with this program, it works better when you have the modules here. You can keep better control of all of them, how they are being executed. Okay. Let's go back to the tutorial here. Ah, so snake make is telling us here that it just finished the first, uh, the rule that we did and one of one steps were done, 100% done. So if we had more than one rule to be executed, this will continue running all the rules that relies on these files here. Okay, back to our, our tutorial here. I just told you guys that when we execute this, using is learn, we need to add this option here cluster. Inside the option cluster, we can put all the information that usually will be in the sbatch file. So essentially what I'm saying here, slash A is my QoS, so it's curse. It's the same information that I have here. The amount of memory that we need to use. Same information that we are providing here. So while this information is the same, we need to use different tags here to incorporate like, so time, number of cores, uh, this will generate the output files, the error files, the email, etc. so on. I'll not try to explain all these parameters quickly, I mean, in, in much details. The most important one here is the J. This is the number of jobs that you are allowing Snake Make to run at the same time. So for example, if you're using the QoS, you don't want Snake Make to take all the resource at once. So you can create this uh, limit here and Snake Make will control how much jobs they want to, they will run at the same time uh, in your QoS. So again here, the, I put the description of the parameters here, but I just mentioned that, so I will skip this part. For more information of, about what is learn parameters, you can add to this script I put here the link to, so you can check all the options that are there. But the easiest way again, in my opinion, to run this is create a configuration file. But now we are going to create a configuration file that has the information to is learned. So instead of providing information for each rule, we are providing the information for is learn to uh, that apply for each rule, how to execute each one of the rules. But uh, in this case here, we most of the time the job or jobs have the same information for some of these fields. For example, it will always run with this parameter as closed. My QoS will be always the same. Uh, the memory most of the time I can use a reasonable number for every for every job. They may true. So what we can create is create one default option that will be uh, the first option for snake make for execute each one of your rules. But in, unless you provide more information, snake make will always use this resource here. But for example, let's assume that for the rule mapping, we don't want to the default options for the parameters, number of threads, outputs, arrow, and memory. So I can just create a new rule here with the name of my 
snake file rule. And snake maker will be able to read, OK, I want all the default parameters, but this one here. This one, I will load this information. With. So essentially, you can create one section for each one of the rules with the parameters that you want to change from the default. And it's like maybe we'll be able to read that. But for that, let's create a new file called cluster EML. I'll do that a little quicker since we don't have much time. Uh, again, I will add that to git to control that and I will load it on my arrow here. So I will copy all the options here. So now on, this is my default options. So we have like the, the system that it will be using, memory, QoS, and then, et cetera. If you're running this code, please remember to, to change your, your QoS and also your email to add the ones that you can actually pull the resource from. Otherwise, the job will fail. Uh, okay. Let me go back here. And since we want to change these parameters for this rule, let's also add this here. Now we have information in this file too, and we'll also commit that, keep our chain safe. Something happened here. Oh, I forgot the, the option M here in the command. Guys, if you are running this command here, remember of using the option minus M, that means message. Okay. How we actually execute this command is Probably the, the best way to explain that is like, I just showed here how you could execute this command uh, rule by rule, adding the information by yourself. But in a real life tutorial pipeline, uh, in general, you don't want to execute the rules one by one. You have one rule that will execute all of them. I will show it soon. But uh, why we, so since we will have one rule executed, all of them, we want Snake Make to be able to read the, the configuration file and execute these options one for each rule without us needing to actually change one by one. Uh, the way we can do this is with adding a new option here. So we have the same command as before, but now I added the option cluster config. This tells Snake Make to look for a configuration file that in this case is called cluster EML. So now Snake Make will first look in this config cluster file to read the parameters. And then you pass the same parameters here in the cluster using this variable here. So essentially cluster config is creating a variable called cluster that you can use inside this option here. And now SnakeMake will be able to read your configuration file, pull the information from there, and use for each rule here. Essentially, we are doing the same thing as before. Remember, we did the same thing with all the other rules, reading the configuration file, uh, pull all the information, and then execute that. So for the rule mapping, we will be creating the same code here. Did you guys understand that so far? Have you understand this option here? So essentially now, once we finish the, cluster, the configuration file, the cluster configuration file, the snake file, we can just execute snake make like this. And it will read all the, the configurations for each one of the rules in the snake file. You don't need to put the name here. Actually, we will, we will go there soon. So far, this is the, the end goal. We want to create a command that do not rely in the name of the rules. But if we execute that like that, 
it will try to execute the first rule in our snake file. Since the first rule was already executed and the files is still in the output here, it's still in the, all the necessary, all the outputs of the rule mapping is still here. So snake make is telling me, oh, there is nothing to do. All the outputs are already there. The next and last step of this pipeline will be to learn how to execute all the rules of your, of, of your workflow without passing the names here. For that, we take advantage of these characters of snake make. When we run snake make without any rule like we did here, rule name, it will try to read the first rule in your snake file. So now what we are going to do uh, is create a new rule called all, like this, and this rule will run everything. But before, let's add some more information in our snake file. I, I create two more rules here. I will not explain them because essentially they do the same concepts of the other one. So let's just add these two, two rules here. Uh, in our snake file. So what these rule, rules will do is taking the outputs of the mapping, sorting them, and then using them to make the assembly of the transcripts. We don't need to go in much details here because the goal is show how to execute many rules at the same time. In the same way, we are going to add the configuration information for each one of that rule. So we have two new rules here. And I added the information for both of them here, the parameters. And now in the cluster, I will also add the information for this new two rules. I think you added the cluster stuff to the configuration and vice versa. Sorry, can you say that again? Sure, Christian. I think you added the cluster stuff to the configuration file and the configuration stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Let me correct. Thank you. Okay. So now I have the three files. All of them are synchronized with snake make. Let's just test something here. Again, if I try to run the common without any rule, even though I have more rules in the snake file, it will try to run only the first one. Since the first one, there is nothing to be done, it will stop. And the other rules will still not be executed. The way to trick Snake made to run that is create a new rule. We usually call this rule as all. And this rule will receive as input all the outputs of the other rules. So for example, I am taking here the outputs of the rule mapping, the outputs of the rule sorting, the outputs of the rule assembly. So now I'll move this rule here for the first I will add that as the first rule of my snake file. Okay, we have now a rule called all, and essentially this rule is taking the input x, uh, the outputs files for each one of the other rules as input. Since these rules are not going to do anything for us, we don't need to have an output file or a shell or anything else. Okay, now that we have this file there, look what happened when we try to execute snake make again without any name. So now snake make is recognized that there is a rule called all inside that. This rule wants some files and these files were not generated yet. And to generate these files, it needs to run these two jobs here, the job assim and the sorting. sorting. So uh, what we are doing here is essentially creating one rule that will kind of tricky snake make to run all the other ones. Because if it doesn't run all the other rules, it will not have the inputs 
for the rule L. Uh, is, is that clear for everyone? I don't know if I went too fast in this last uh, step. Okay. Uh, I don't think I will actually run this rule. We could do that. I mean, I, actually, let's, let's run that to see how uh, Snake Make will submit these jobs for us. So I just remove the option N here. Now, Snake Make is submitting three jobs for his, for uh, his learn, and it gives you the ID here. If we connect again to the server. I think I mistake my password here. Yeah, if I list here the jobs, I can see that snake make is running a job in my name here. And this is the idea of the job now. Probably it's already changing. So uh, in this way, what we can see is exactly that. Snake make is running all the rules for me now, one by one, because in this case, since they relies on the outputs of each other, snake make cannot run parallel, uh, cannot run them in parallel. But if we had more rules in the workflow that did not rely on these inputs or outputs files, it could be run both of them together. So. We see here, for example, they make already run one of three steps and is running the second one right now, the assembly of the two scripts. Okay. Uh, I think I will stop the execution of the code now. We are about to, to get to the end of the, the workshop. Uh, I will just check the, the questions now, but I just want to show you guys this option here. It's very interesting. If you have time, run that by yourself. Uh, Snake make essentially can create a, a HTML file with a lot of reports information. So for example, Snake make will tell you how much time did you spend to run each one of the rules, uh, what uh, output files were created for each one of the rules and so on. So it's very useful when you want to, to understand what your code is doing. If you have like a problem, something's not working, you can try, try to run this and read this HTML file and try to understand what's going on better. Uh, okay, so now I will take the questions. You guys can both type in the chat or I think believe we can also uh, turn on the video and audio if you guys prefer. Okay. Okay, I think the, the next question here is like, uh, is if we have the previous results there, snake make won't ever execute again. That means if the output files are newer in the environment than the input, yes, snake make will not run that because it would say, okay, you had this input file, I executed this and create these outputs here. So there is no reason to create the outputs again because the input is the same. But let's say that I have a, a rule and then I deleted these files of input and I changed that for a new file. Now Snake Maker will say, okay, I already have the outputs here, but this output is outdated because the input file is newer than the output. So I need to run that again. So this is one uh, of the ways to make Snake Make run that. The other way is running this option here. Uh, let me see if I put that here, but you can do Snake Make. Force. Snake make force will force the rule to run. Doesn't matter if the output is already there or not. So if you change, for example, one parameter, that will not change the input file. So sometimes snake make will not recognize that as a, a change big enough to run again the rule. So you can just uh, do snake make force to run it. Uh, uh, where did I? add the rule all. Let me show that again. I add that in my snake file and it needs to be the first rule. So 
I have the other three rules here and I added the rule out here. And uh, just to, to explain that once more, the inputs of these rules are actually the outputs of the other rules. So if you check this code here, it is exactly the same code here. So I just took all the outputs of the other rules and I put here as the input of the rule wall. Because then it will uh, force the execution of other other rules. And as in the other rules, the comma here is very important. If you forget that, it will not execute. Okay, so uh, folks, I think this is what I had to show for you guys today. I once again, I, I think this is a lot of information for a short period of time, and talking while while I execute all the commands is a little hard. So I'm not sure if everyone understood everything. But if you have questions, go again to the tutorial that I sent for you guys in the morning and go through all the steps, do that again in your own pace, try to also go to the Snake Make tutorial and read all the, the, the sections there. Uh, I listed here some topics that I think are more advanced than I wanted to show today, but that could be really interesting for your workflows. So uh, I think that's it. If you have any question, you can, say that now or type, type here and once again thank you thank you for uh, your attention during all this time thank you so much wendell i think this was really great and i hope that everyone else learned a lot i think you did a good job of explaining everything so i'm really happy. yeah good job thank you wendell You're welcome um, so like we kind of said during the event um, wendell referenced a couple of things that he will send us and so he'll I think you can just send me that and then I will um, forward it to everyone who signed up. Um, yeah. Final uh -huh. your comments from anybody else? Yeah just uh, I will not promise that I will send that today still but by the end of the week for sure because I need to read out again where uh, the list of um, packages that I have in my arrow and also search for some resource, but I can do, certainly do that. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you, bye. bye. Oh, Wendell, um, mm -hmm. do you, would you be okay with us making, um, I'm gonna update our website with some of the events that we've been up to lately and mm -hmm. i was wondering if i could link the like a link to this html file it would be yeah, sure. is that okay yeah sure yeah. there is no problem for me uh just one i mean yeah let me just double check if i seated all the the reference manuals that i use and stuff and or we can just add that in the information for example i i'm pretty sure i seated everything i use to create this but it's always good to double check just in case. But I will tell you yeah. about that and I, I have no problem about linking this. Um, also, we recorded it. Um, do you care if we make that available? Just um, someone asked about it. No, okay. I, don't, I don't care. Okay, so Natalia, we can, we can publish that too. Yeah, if you guys want to. I mean, it's a long video, but probably you can make some additions there to make it more easy to understand, but I don't mind. Okay. Thank you. So you can just double check that you that you mm -hmm. have everything that you want cited and then yeah. send me the other stuff like next week or something. Yeah. I will do that as soon as possible and then I send for you the all the information. Probably it will be in the beginning of the next week. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. All right. Bye bye. 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 So much, Wendell. This was really amazing. Okay. Really yeah. great. <laughs> I already I'm glad that it to uh, helped people too. Yeah, I feel more organized like already. I'm pretty excited mm -hmm. to like mess around. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, once you start to actually execute these codes, you can not work without these anymore. Like, uh, for example, I'm just working my papers now, 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, I feel like after three, four months, the reviewer asks you to change stuff in your code. It's a nightmare if you don't have a system like this because you forget everything. Yeah. So this system really helped in this sense. I'm really excited. And I think that you did a really good job of making it like, like I thought it was useful, but I also feel like if I didn't use Hypergator, I would still learn something. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, yeah. I think you balanced it really, really well. I'm so. Yeah, I hope so because I mean, uh, to be honest, I was very surprised when I I saw the, the list yesterday with the level of background of each one. Yeah. I mean, almost like 40% of the people have never run a bash script. So this is really hard to understand once you don't have this background, actually. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but I do think that if anyone has done even a little bit, they definitely would have gotten it. Yeah. yeah and if they... someone a couple people messaged me like like private and they Mm. were like this is so cool like oh that's good so yeah um, let me know what people tell you about that so i can improve myself for the next time but i am i think i I am happy with the tutorial and everything else i think it was a good i'm really happy with it and i'll ask people what they thought if they have any comments but i really am happy with it so thank you so much it looks Thank you for helping to organize all this stuff. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.